Good morning, Harris County, and welcome to the Homegrown Lecture Series. It is Thursday, it is 10 a.m., and this program is brought to you by the Ag and Natural Resources Unit of the Harris County Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Office. Today, uh, our topic is Garden Hummingbird Safety, which will be brought to you by Brandy Keller, our horticulture agent. Uh, in two weeks, we will be back here with Cooking Safely Outdoors, which will be presented by Shannon Dietz. The rest of the month, uh, we will follow up with fall vegetable gardening, enhancing your dishes with flavored butters, and we will close out the quarter with growing microgreens at the windowsill. So without any further ado, uh, Brandy Keller, it is all yours. All right. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm ju I just kept this slide up from uh, my last one uh, just to remind everyone that we started a podcast so we have our first two months uh, up already and uh, you can either um, scan that QR code uh, on your screen or um, uh, just visit us on our on that website if you get the newsletter also uh, there's direct links on that so Stay tuned for more with those. All right, so for today's talk, um, it is hummingbird safety in the garden. And um, I mean, you really don't have to be a birder to want hummingbirds in the garden. Um, I mean, they're just, you know, these small, super fast little bundles of joy. I mean, I, I don't know anyone that, uh, you know, has seen a hummingbird in the garden that hasn't, you know, probably started it with, oh, oh my gosh, look. Um, I mean, I could see it a hundred times and every time I get excited. So um, we not only want to bring hummingbirds to our garden, but uh, really try to keep them safe since that's their, um, their retreat their space for um, replenishing their energy. So what we're going to cover today are uh, just, this is going to be a real, real simple overview of the types of hummingbirds that uh, you might find in your garden around Houston and Harris County. Uh, a couple of them definitely, you know, you'd be able to find, you know, much more north if you're looking, um, if you're watching elsewhere. Uh, we'll talk about uh, plantings. Uh, what to plant to attract hummingbirds, uh, their basic needs, uh, going over feeders, uh, risks and predators, and then uh, if you find a grounded bird or you have one, uh, you know what to do. So all the things that will keep um, those little bundles of joy safe. So hummingbirds. So hummingbirds are actually found uh, from Alaska all the way to the um, southern tip of South America. They are only found in the Americas, so we are special that way. Um, with over 300 species, most of them are found in the tropics. And again, they're um, in our area, we just have a handful of regulars. We're going to go over three basic ones um, that you can find and then there's there's a few more especially you know when it's um, when they're migrating through. So the first and probably most most well known I think in general um, you know from the north to the south would be the ruby throated hummingbird. Uh, it's really identifiable with the male species because of that red throat. Um, the female the one on the uh, bottom right you know, she has a little bit more of that dull olive green and none of that brilliant red. Um, and also with that red, sometimes depending on where you're seeing that hummingbird in the garden, uh, it won't even look red. Sometimes it looks black. So the sun has to be hitting it just right. Uh, so in our area, these uh, come through about March, but when they're coming through from the south, uh, going north, they come through much quicker. They're, you know, their their goal is to get to their nesting grounds. Um, but this is probably um, the only hummingbird in this area that would likely nest. They don't nest in large numbers, but uh, you know, they you definitely can find some nesting ruby throats. Um, ruby throated. Uh, in the fall, they're going to take a little bit more time. Um, so 
they generally show up around August. Uh, I just had someone say that they've recently seen one, you know, and of course it's mid-July. Um, and who knows, that may be a resident hummingbird. Uh, but when they're coming to um, migrate through, uh, that's really going to hit their stride like the first couple of weeks in September. And they do linger a bit longer because, you know, they have a long flight, uh, whether they're flying over the Gulf or down along the coast. Uh, they're really building up those reserves uh, to give them enough energy. Think about how darn tiny they are and how long they've they fly. So, you know, I think any of us would be surprised that they make that flight um, to begin with. It, it is really just a marvel. So the second one is the black-chinned hummingbird. And again, you know, there's no confusing this one with the ruby-throated male. Uh, he's got his purple, uh, but the female does look very much like the um, the ruby-throated female. And, you know, you can talk to regular birders and sometimes, uh, you know, they'll have to take photos and then, you know, sometimes they'll know right away, but other times they have to do their research too, um, just because some of these uh, birds look um, very similar. And again, not confused with the other two is the Rufus hummingbird. I actually have not seen this one. Um, so if you get it in your yard, please give me a call. I'll come over. Um, <laughs> so it has that orange and that really beautiful rusty color. Um, but the cool thing I think about this one is that female actually has some color, um, that olive green uh, around the chin and even up on the head and then that side. Um, you know, that side rust color. These guys are very territorial and they generally winter in Mexico. Uh, but because we are where we are, uh, you may be able to find these in, uh, you know, around the fall and winter here. And here's a bit, uh, four others that uh, the Houston Audubon uh, has listed on their page. Um, the Annas, Allens, Broad-tailed, and the Buff-bellied. Um, again, these are coming from the south, probably nesting way more north, so they're going to be uh, real transitory just in, um, during migration. All right, so not even a bird. <laughs> uh, I couldn't resist talking about the hummingbird moth. Um, I get just as excited, honestly, seeing a hummingbird moth on, um, on our flowers um, as I do hummingbirds. Um, a lot of times they can be uh, confused. Uh, what always stands out to me is uh, my first thought is, wait a minute, that doesn't look like a bird. Uh, something's really off with that. <laughs> You know, because they can be moving quickly too. And as soon as they say that, you know, it's like, okay, it's got to be a moth. Um, so before we get to the nectar plants, uh, I do want to ask people, uh, our viewers, uh, if you know the link uh, between these hummingbird moths and one of our arch nemesises, two, two of our arch nemesis in the, in the garden. Um, and those are, you go ahead and type in uh, your guesses on the caterpillar, and I'm going to tell you the adult form. So two other of these moths that can be considered a hummingbird moth um, is the Carolina Sphinx and then the five-spotted hawk moth. So uh, do we have any guesses on what those two moths, what their caterpillar form is, that um, we're not, you know, we don't tend to be best friends with in our garden. And I know there's a little bit of a delay, so I'm kind of filling in the space. Um, but Paul, do, you, do we have any guesses yet on um, what caterpillars those are? Uh, no, we do not. Um... No responses yet. All right. Paul, Shannon, do you guys have a guess? Or do you know? Uh, I do not. You do not. <laughs> All right. Well, we might get some guesses coming in, but I will tell you the Carolina Sphinx is the tobacco hornworm. And the five-spotted hawk moth is uh, the tomato horn hornworm. So now that you know that, uh, I'll leave it up to you whether you're going to sacrifice your tomato. Uh, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> but uh, 
yeah, I thought that might be a little interesting tidbit for you. All right, going into nectar plants for the garden. Um, the good news is, is if you have uh, hummingbirds already, you see them in your yard, then you probably already have some nectar sources that they prefer. Um, so what makes a good flower? Uh, number one, it's tubular and odorless, and number two, some kind of bright uh, color. They do eat, um, they feed many times a day. They can feed two to five times a day. Uh, depending on the season, they can uh, eat 100 to 200 times their body weight. Yes, you heard that right. That statistic came from the Hummingbird Society. So they eat a lot. So what they're looking for is um, a flower that can hold a lot of nectar. And these tubular flowers, they hold more nectar than other flowers. Uh, they tend to be odorless just because these the style of flower tends to be odorless uh, because that's not what attracts hummingbirds. Hummingbirds uh, don't are not attracted by the scent. It is that bright color. So that's why those bright colors come um, come in. Now whether the flower evolved to the hummingbird or the hummingbird evolved to the flower, who knows, but they have this beautiful relationship because those types of flowers generally, other than like that hummingbird moth, um, maybe some others, uh, they're really not going to be pollinated by, um, you know, insects. So that shape and those colors really play uh, an important factor. And then we've probably heard that, you know, red is associated to hummingbirds. Number one, it's a bright color, um, but uh, really like reds, oranges, even purples. Um, it doesn't mean that whites or yellows don't have hummingbirds. There are some plants that have yellow flowers. Uh, it's just, they're gonna be less than those, uh, those warmer colors. All right, so here's my next question, and then I'm going to talk some to give you time because uh, there's a delay on here. Um, so how does a hummingbird tongue get to the nectar? So this is a really cool picture here because it shows uh, that long bill and then that um, even longer tongue that uh, extends beyond the bill. So how does that tongue, does anyone know, um, how that tongue actually gets the nectar. And while you're thinking about that, and hopefully I'm sending in some answers, I'm gonna give you a couple, um, couple little uh, factoids. <laughs> so number one, um, these birds are extremely light. Uh, they only weigh about three grams, and that can equate to the weight of one penny, yes. I said that right, one penny. Um, definitely less than a nickel. So um, just the fact that they do that long migration and that's how much they weigh, I mean, that is that is so incredible. It's hard not to be in awe. Um, and then the heartbeat, uh, it beats 600 times per minute. Everything about this um, bird is so fast. Um, so those are your two little tidbits. Uh, I don't know if anyone had any guesses on how that tongue um, gets the nectar back into the mouth. Paul, are there any guesses? Yes, there is one, uh, and they said it laps it up. All right. Well, I expected either one uh, or one of two um, answers. One, that it sucks it up like a straw, which is not correct. It does, it does not do it by capillary action. Uh, so that person is right, it laps it. So very similar to a cat lapping, uh, you know, water or milk. Uh, they lap anywhere from 12 to 20 times per second. <laughs> So when you think, you just, it's hard for us. I mean, we blink a lot, you know, even in just one minute and, you know, it still doesn't compare to the heartbeats, the, the wing beats, and even the lapping sometimes of, of hummingbirds. Uh, what you can't see in this picture is the end of that tongue is split. So when it goes out and it laps, um, as it comes back, those two pieces um, come back together and it traps that liquid. Uh, so it can usually drain a flower in um, about an, just one second. 
And that's why you see them moving so fast. Uh, you know, they've, they've taken all the nectar. Uh, I didn't need this picture in here, um, but you know, definitely I think we all need more um, pictures of hummingbird tongues in our life. <laughs> But um, the other thing that I thought was really cool about this picture is, look at that perch. That had to have been made specifically for hummingbirds. Um, we are going to talk about perches, so keep this in mind. Uh, you know, this definitely gives me some ideas. You know, uh, uh, they they need somewhere to rest, and uh, whoever whoever uh, has this one. Uh, they must get a lot of uh, hummers because, you know, they have special perches for them. <laughs> All right, so this is really the bulk of what I'm going to cover with plants um, because there are so many resources out there. Uh, if you're around Houston, uh, first of all, the um, Houston Audubon, there's a link um, that not only talks about the the, the hummingbirds that we have in the area, but it also talks about the um, the flowers that they're attracted to in the area. So that's a good link. Um, there's the Native Plant Society, there's Mercer uh, Botanic Gardens. Um, so there's, there's a lot of really great resources around Houston uh, to guide you on what to get. Uh, here, I just wanted to kind of point out the different categories. You know, there's annuals, perennial shrubs, and trees. And what you're doing there is you're giving, um, you're providing those sources at different uh, heights. Uh, the asterisk I put for um, flowers that are blooming in the fall. I just went ahead and threw one on the annuals because depending if they're coming back from the summer um, or if they made it through, uh, you know, those those could possibly be around in August and September also. Um, so the ones without the asterisk are for the spring and then uh, the ones with the asterisk are in the fall. And that's important because if you're looking to um, provide uh, food sources for hummingbirds uh, year round or, you know, whenever we have get them, uh, you want you want both seasons. Um, I don't know, maybe in the chat, go ahead. If you have hummingbirds, what is, uh, what is that plant or what are those plants in your particular yard that always bring the hummingbirds? Uh, I can tell you mine. Uh, the number one one is the Pride of Barbados. And that is, um, I mean, that's just a photograph waiting to happen anyway, you know, when the hummingbirds on that. Um, so the Pride of Barbados definitely is the number one thing. Uh, number two, I'd say the Tropical Salvia, and then maybe it's tied with three, the Bottle Brush. So those are the three plants in my yard. If you have a hummingbird on a different plant or just let us know in the comments and I'll ask Paul in a moment. Uh, that second picture with the uh, Turk's cap, uh, Turk's cap is also a Texas superstar. So, you know, it, it's gonna do really great here, um, even through some droughts. Um, so those are beautiful. That's definitely a good attractor. Some of them, I think there's a couple on here that I didn't get on there. One might be the Kufia, um, the firecracker plant. That's, that's definitely a hummingbird. Um, plant, um, some annuals, Nicotiana, Calabrocoa, um, trying to see what else might not be on here. Oh, and I stuck in two vines that those are the, under the trees in the um, light peach color. That was how I crept those in. Um, the other thing you want to um, consider too is you know, if you have a lot of plants crammed in one space, think about how those hummingbirds um, are able to get from flower to flower. So in general, there's, you know, there's not a lot of trouble with that, but it depends on your yard. Paul, do we have any um, comments on what brings hummingbirds to uh, their gardens? Uh, we absolutely do. Uh, <laughs> let's see, let me roll through. Um, Suma said, bee balm, Turks cap, okay. salvia. We have a lantana, we have ruelia, we have another Turks cap, uh, Suma added Hamalia, uh, James has salvia, we've got uh, Gregi, 
uh, sage. So that's uh, another salvia. So salvias are 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 quite mm -hmm. important. Um, we've got Himalaya, fairy duster, salt marshmallow, and salvia. And then we also have a, a yucca. Um, oh, yeah. the, the one that they love at my house is Duranta. Uh, especially when they come through in, in the you know late summer fall, mm -hmm. they just work that plant like crazy. So yeah, um, and purple. So goes yes. to show purple. Purple gets them too. Yep. Yep. <laughs> All right. Great. Um, yeah, there were a couple in there that uh, caught my attention. So I'll have to re-listen to this. Um, so this is what um, these are the plants that they do like. So what? does not make a good flower. Generally, those are going to be, uh, you know, flat flowers like that dianthus on the left or anything multi-petaled. Uh, definitely this rose, they probably have no interest in that. Uh, things like sunflowers, irises, um, gardenia. Gardenia is, is kind of flat, but then the other thing about that is what? It's that scent. Um, so that is attracting a whole different type of pollinator. Um, those are usually moths in the evening. Uh, oriental li lilies, they don't want anything to do with. And again, that has, you know, that has a pretty intense scent. Um, and I don't want to leave out, uh, so these are, this, these are sources of nectar, but hummingbirds also need a source of protein. So even if these flowers are not um, very good for nectar, they may help bring in these small insects that hummingbirds need, um, small spiders and, and other things. So um, just because one flower doesn't uh, provide nectar, it may provide something else. So if you already have an existing landscape um, and you need either more hummingbird plants or you don't really have any and you want to incorporate them, uh, these are just some ideas. Uh, obviously, if you have any um, spots or, or larger spaces, you know, that you can add in the layering, uh, you can add in new plants there. Um, consider those native plants. Um, they will support native um, insects and wildlife. So not all hummingbird plants are native, uh, but uh, you know if, if you're if you want to um, you know have that um, aspect of it, you know take a look to see which ones are native. Uh, if you don't have a lot of space, uh, there's a lot of hummingbird plants that are vines. Um, so adding a trellis, uh, I know like what Paul said, um, there was a, well, that Duranta got hit a couple different times, but uh, he had two growing up over a trellis, um, looked really sharp. And you don't need a big yard or really any yard. If you, uh, you know, have a patio, a balcony, uh, it is possible to attract, attract them, um, you know, with hanging pots and containers. So uh, definitely don't discount that. They will find you. <laughs> and then think about those spring and fall blooms too. Uh, one of the other talks I gave this resource um, for, and it applies here too, it is really cool. Um, so this is the Audubon Native Plants Database. So the left, I, I don't really have it delineated real well, but um, the left side here, you go ahead and you put in your zip code. And then on the right side, uh, there's a drop down and you can click any or all um, shapes of plants. So in this case, I picked shrubs and trees. And then you go over here and uh, you're trying to attract hummingbirds. So there's other bird um, options. And in the, uh, then it comes up with a whole list. So here you have your sage and your coral bean. Um, so this is a really, I mean, the more I, I keep looking at it, <laughs> you know, it's, it kind of does all the work for you, right? Um, another good resource too is the um, Lady Bird Johnson um, Wildflower website. That one's good, but I just really love how this one really caters um, specifically for plants to the birds. And then on top of it, it's not even um, a list. You actually get the picture too, so maybe you're not great at identifying. So that may, um, you know, that may help you out. Uh, and that is audubon.org native plants. So just go on and play with that and see what you find.
All right, so basic needs of the hummingbird, and there's a lot of different um, little safety things within this. Uh, so they're going to need what most any of us need, um, food, water, shelter, rest, and nest. Maybe our nest doesn't look like that theirs, but we still have a nest, right? <laughs> All right, so food. Um, so this is going, um, this is talking about the, there's going to be plants. You can do uh a feeder, which that's a whole nother category, so we'll get to that. Um, and I did point out, I have two photographs in here. Um, I pointed these out because uh, I put this presentation together using Canva, and all these photos came from Canva. I mean, it was, it's just fabulous. Um, so all the other photos, unless, you know, it's those two pictures with my name, um, they all come from there. Um, so this is a picture that I took um, on the tropical sage. Um, for me, that tropical sage, it does take quite a bit. I refuse to get rid of it, number one. I refuse to get rid of it. Um, but it is, it can be maintenance because <laughs> all those seeds, I try to get the, um, I try to deadhead it before, you know, you just can't do it all summer long. Um, so that's one that, you know, it takes a little bit of work. I do a little bit of work for those hummingbirds because I refuse to get rid of this because of them. Um, but don't forget, uh, there it is, <laughs> um, the protein. So the spider, the little spider coming down. Um, this is why it's really important to be conscientious about insecticides uh, because uh, depending on what you use, it can really inhibit um, food for hummingbirds and you know other wildlife. Uh, but think about how small those bodies are and um, even if you're using, you know, chemicals around the plants that provide the nectar, uh, you know, that buildup can happen. All right, water. Um, first of all, I'm going to tell you, do not worry about this hummingbird on the left. It is just totally fooling you. Um, <laughs> it looks like it is not well. Um, so, you know, it, he's just you know, bending down, getting a drink of water. Um, so of course they need a source of water, um, bird baths, um, standing water, misters. Um, but you can see the bird bath on the right. Generally those um, are just gonna be too deep for them. So you may wanna add some pebbles in there or some rocks. Um, the other thing they like are misters. So I think if you get a mister and you have hummingbirds, you may find that they really like to um, play around with those. But they need fresh water too. What they will not utilize is water um, from the ground which is probably good anyway, just because of predators. Shelter, um, so around your yard, uh, whether it's your yard or maybe you're in an um, apartment complex, there's probably some shrubs and trees around. So trees are important for um, all wildlife, no different for uh, hummingbirds. You know, they perch, they eat, they um, play, they eat, they get nesting materials, uh, you know, from trees and shrubs. Uh, with the storms that we have come through here, I mean, just think about it, you know, I mean, hummingbird season is during uh, hurricane season. So uh, those, those little um, guys and gals need a place to take shelter. Uh, the tree on the right reminds me of a previous house that I had, and it had, um, it wasn't a live oak, I was up north. Um, <laughs> it was probably like a pin oak or something. Um, but the hummingbird would come to our um, feeder, our, our plants and feed, and then it would go and sit up on um, a, a big live oak limb. It wasn't actually a big live oak limb. It just looked big compared to him. I always just really love the contrast, you know, of that really tiny, delicate bird on that limb. Um, but uh, so if you don't have um, these types of things in your yard, you have a bigger yard, you know, go ahead and consider that. And then just resting, um, you know, it doesn't need like a big shrub or tree. Uh, you saw that one perch. Uh, the picture on the right, again, is mine, and the reason I point that out is because uh, this little girl comes every year, and she will um, 
She'll feed on the pride of Barbados and then she'll just fly up to the top where there are seed pods on it and just rest. And she just sits there and hangs out for the longest time. <laughs> um, but, you know, they can rest on plants or, you know, the upper right. It looks like there's, you know, a little perch right there. Um, even if you're on a patio or balcony, um, you can utilize some twigs or even some, you know, woody shrubs to give them a place to perch. Uh, Paul, is this video playing? Yes, it is. Okay, so um, I didn't need to add this in. It's just it's so adorable, so I did. Um, but this is what they do. <laughs> so you're the human inside the house looking from the window, and this is just what they do to us, right? Um, we're not watching TV. Uh, this bird is just simply sitting there, and we're just like, oh my gosh, it's just sitting there. Look how cute. Oh, he's looking around. Look, I wonder what he's looking at. <laughs> um, maybe it's just my house. <laughs> my husband has to tell me, Brandy, you don't have to narrate everything that's going on in the backyard. And for years, I say, no, yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> um, and provide um, places for nesting. Of course, you know, it's it's not going to be, um, like I said, some of the ruby-throated will nest here. So, um, you know, we can definitely have those. Uh, but it looks like the plant on the left is a bottle brush. So I think that's pretty cute because that would actually, you'd actually be able to um, see it a little bit better. Um, but the picture on the right, I wanted to point out, you know, we have a lot of lichen, which we'll get calls about. You know, it is completely fine. Um, but those hummingbirds use spider webs and that lichen for that outer portion of their nest. Um, so... They utilize all types of things from our yard. Um, I'll even put out an, um, animal fur, you know, if I've brushed a cat or a dog. Um, and sometimes you'll find uh, just man-made material um, tucked in some of these nests too. All right, so I just made this up. We're gonna have what's called speed round. Um, this does not work by typing in an answer. Uh, you actually have to yell it out at home. So, you know, if you have someone in the other room, you wanna yell it out even louder. So that way they just think that you've lost your mind, okay? So, so um, okay, we're gonna start speed round. So how big is a hummingbird nest? One inch, three inches, or five inches? All right, yes, just yell it out. All right, one inch, it is one inch. I don't know, you guys probably got that one because um, they're so tiny. Um, how small is a hummingbird egg? Three grains of sand, a jelly bean, or the size of a nickel? Okay, I don't care if you don't know it all. If you don't know it, just yell an answer out. I think I can hear you. Um, all right, the hummingbird egg is about the size of a jelly bean. So hummingbirds are one of three birds that can fly backwards, true or false. All right, yell it out. I tried to trick you here, so I hear a lot of trues and I'll be like, aha, I got you, it is false. You know why it's false? Because they are the only bird that can fly backwards. <laughs> so if you yelled out true, I gotcha. Um, and then the last one, hummingbirds can walk with their legs. Um, first of all, that's a really weird statement, right? <laughs> they have legs. <laughs> so yell it out, true or false, they can walk with their legs. All right, this one is false. They can't walk with their legs. Who knew? Um, they fly and they just hang there and then they can, you know, uh, move sideways on their perch. So, no, they can't walk with their legs. If you take anything away from today, anything, then this might be it. You'll be uh, repeating that little fact uh, everywhere you go. Okay, so speed round is over. Uh, now we're going to go on to feeders, uh, do's and don'ts. This could be a whole presentation, um, but uh, I'm not going to um, 
spend too much time. Uh, essentially, there are two general types of feeders. One is inverted, like the one on the left, where you put in um, the nectar and then you know you turn it upside down, um, or basin feeders, like the one on the right, where the water's just sitting on the base. Um, there are pros and cons for each of these. There's plenty of information out um, on the websites. Uh, I know at some point Paul's going to add the Hummingbird Society, um, all about birds, which I'll get to that one too. Um, but a lot of these reputable sites, um, even the probably the Audubon, uh, the Houston Audubon, uh, they can guide you. Uh, but you really want two main, um, two big things that are your deciding factor. Um, number one, you have to have red parts to it. Uh, if you don't, um, you know, they just might not um, see it as well. And too easy to clean uh, because if you're not cleaning it, you're no, not providing a safe uh, nectar for those hummingbirds. And uh, you don't want something that's going to be a hassle because then you're going to dread doing it. Uh, I like the idea of having two hummingbird feeders and it's a less of a headache of, you know, switching them out and um, cleaning them. So, you know, you can bring one in and you can clean it as you're at your leisure and then put the other one out. Um, Optional, there's a perch that is a good um, option because they do perch. A bee guard, like you see on the left, um, or an ant moat, and those can um, keep the ants out of, um, you know, from that sugar water. All right, so I'm going to have you look at these. And uh, just if you want to type it in, you can type it in. Um, but let me know what you think. Are these good options for uh, hummingbird feeders? And while I give you time to do that, uh, I have another little factoid. And that is uh, the hummingbird beats their wings 70 times per second. Isn't that crazy? Per second. So per minute, like, oh, well over 4,000 times per minute. That is, that's incredible. Um, I don't think that was 30 seconds to let people um, give their input. Uh, Paul, do we have any, uh, any, any opinions on whether these are, um, these would make good hummingbird feeders? Okay, well, from paying attention to you, I would say no, but someone posted that they have a copper colored one uh, in the, in their front and they come to it all the time. Okay. Yeah, um, I've seen that the one on the left, um, and, and I think those are, I think that's red um, where that nectar is. Sometimes they come in color, copper too, uh, copper color. So yeah, I mean, they can work, especially if you have some nectar around. Um, but if you're having problems, then you want to look into if that's one of the issues. Uh, the one on the right, uh, but to be honest, I don't, I don't, I would not want to clean that one out. <laughs> I just would not want to. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it ultimately comes down to what works for you. All right, no red dye ever. I think every one of us get that reference, right? <laughs> I was laughing so hard when I was putting this together. Um, I grew up on that. Um, Okay, so I might be a little dramatic here saying it that way. Um, it, it's, there's just so much information out there. There have definitely been reports from people who do rehabilitation that, you know, they found babies that, you know, that red dye has actually, um, you know, it's became, become evident, you know, in those babies. Um, but in general, it's just really unnecessary. Um, just get a hummingbird feeder that has red on it uh, and make your own nectar. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, once you start looking up red dye, um, but when it comes to the research side of it, you know, I think there's um, there's probably um, 
work to be done there. But in general, all the um, hummingbird reputable sources, uh, they just say that it's, it's just really unnecessary. The reason it's unnecessary is because the recipe is so um, easy and we're gonna get to that too. Um, and then I added in a window feeder. That's a really big hummingbird, right? <laughs> I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty funny. I don't know if that's a um, red-bellied woodpecker, a juvenile. Um, so the window feeder may be counterintuitive. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about windows, um, but you would think maybe it wouldn't be that safe uh, because it is right at the window. Uh, but the things um, that I've encountered uh, actually say that they're not actually that bad because if there's a feeder at the window, those birds are slowing because they know that that, um, that food source is there, so they're slowing. So it's not like you're gonna get a lot of window strikes. Um, and obviously there's a big, I don't know, sugar moat there or something for that woodpecker to, uh, <laughs> to be hanging on there like that. So that was pretty cute. All right, so the nectar recipe that is super easy. One part sugar, four parts water. Boil, melt, cool. It's that easy. Um, you can keep uh, extra in the refrigerator for about a week. You don't want to go longer than that. Um, and then you just want to experiment like with the size of your feeder. You know, obviously if you did one cup sugar and four cups water, it's going to make a lot of nectar. And you may never use that. Um, so something like a half, uh, half cup sugar and then one cup water. Uh, sometimes, you know, it depends on your feeder, that may do you. Uh, you, you want to do this particular ratio because um, less sugar, you may not get the hummingbirds and more sugar, it can actually cause more um, like bacteria issues and, and be harmful. So, I have a question for the audience. Can you substitute honey for sugar in this? And I don't know if I have, um, I think I used all my factoids. I'm all out. <laughs> I'm all well, out. <laughs> I have a question for you. Yes. Uh, if you want. Um, yeah. And this was early on is will hummingbirds mate with other hummingbird species? So would the ruby-throated yeah. uh, mate with a different species? Yes, that can absolutely happen. So um, places that have uh, different, um, you know, different hummingbirds in that area, uh, there can be morphs between a couple of different species. So sometimes identifying can get a little bit tricky. Uh, so yes, it can happen. Okay, and another quick one is what camera do you use for your images that you've had on there? Oh, um, for those two, I have uh, a Canon. Uh, I've like abandoned my camera. I am so sad about it. So all I use is my cell phone now, um, but I'm going to go back to it. I actually, um, but it was a Canon. Oh, it's at the tip of my yeah, so a Canon. I am not a Nikon, Nikon lady. Uh, I know sometimes it's one or the other. I've always stuck with Canon. All right, any other questions or uh, do we have an answer? Can you substitute honey? Uh, it seems that the honey is a unanimous no. Okay, that is very good then. Uh, yes, that, that is a no. You cannot substitute honey. You really can't actually substitute anything but white sugar, and I should have put that in the recipe, white sugar. You can't do raw sugar, the turbinado, molasses, brown sugar, none of it. Um, I know like when, uh, you know, we think it's really cool now, I do this, I buy that raw sugar, uh, but that has um, leftovers of iron in it, and that iron can really be detrimental to um, hummingbirds. Uh, and then also some of the, those like uh, the brown sugar that does have molasses, sometimes that can have molasses in it. Um, but any of those are just too heavy and which means that they can ferment quicker and then it's gonna form mold uh, uh, more quickly. So that's the last thing that we want. Um, so only white sugar. 
even though we shouldn't be eating a ton of it, um, that is what they use for the nectar. And this is pro it's probably one of the bigger mistakes that people use, um, just thinking, you know, that they, that and not changing it um, often enough which leads into how often should nectar be changed. Um, and I know all of you, if you have hummingbirds, you know that it's way more often than we probably do it. Um, 80 degree weather every few days, 90 degrees or higher. I hate to tell you, it's every one to two days. <laughs> And I know it's a hassle. That's why I said maybe getting two feeders would help alleviate that. Uh, you have to change it, you have to clean it. Um, because in our intense humidity and heat, uh, mold can start growing. So you're not doing them any favors by leaving that up. I've actually seen hummingbird feeders that had mold growing um, in it. If it gets cloudy at all, uh, or if you see any mold, you have to take that down immediately and clean. Uh, use hot, um, hot tap water. Um, oh, the next question was how often should the feeder be cleaned and sanitized? Well, every time you change it, there's no reason not to clean it, uh, especially hot tap water, maybe a little bit of mild detergent, uh, but rinse it out really, really well so there's no detergent left. Um, but if you see black mold or um, cloudy water, uh, you can even do it in like a weak um, vinegar solution. Uh, I've seen every, I, I've seen a few different um, solutions, even like a really super weak um, bleach sol solution, but you can't get that mold out of there just by rinsing it out. So do them a favor. Oh, that link at the bottom, uh, I, Paul has a shorter uh, a shorter link, the All About Birds. That's one of my go-tos also for anything birds, Cornell. Um, this is the long version, but uh, he'll put in the short version or he has um, really great resources there. And they talk about cleaning. Any place that has the that deals with hummingbirds is gonna, gonna talk about cleaning. Any questions on that, Paul? Uh, yes, one just came in. Have you ever used Feeder Fresh? No. Okay. What is that? I don't know. <laughs> that, that was the question. Uh, obviously, it must be something to help with the longevity Between. of the uh, product. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes I can be a purist. So, I mean, some things work, some things are okay. Uh, but I tend to just stick to the the least amount of additives. I don't know. Um, I, I'm not familiar with that, but I would definitely go on to the Hummingbird Society, um, the Audubon Society, and see if they have, uh, you know, an answer. Okay, uh, that person just posted and it's, uh -huh. uh, they said it has uh, the micronutrient copper, which helps prevent the mold. Okay. Yeah, again, I'm not familiar with it. So I would, I mean, personally, I would probably look into that, um, you know, with, with the, um, with those hummingbird organizations. Not saying, you know, something can't work for sure. All right. Um, we're getting up there on time. We're coming to an end. Uh, predators and other risks. All right, so I'm asking you to type this in. What is the most common predator to the hummingbird? And while you guys are typing that in, I am going to talk about window collisions. So birds are not big dummies when they, you know, fly into a window. It's like, what, can't you see that's a window? My gosh, what are you thinking? Um, no, they're not big dummies. It's that the, all they see is that reflection. And especially if you have a lot of trees, shrubs, or that nature behind you, uh, that's what they see. Uh, so they think they're they're going towards nature. <laughs> so be careful um, with window collisions. I've never really had an issue with it. Uh, I had a cardinal that pecked at an upstairs window before. Um, I love to have the window open when the crab apples were blooming, uh, but this this uh, cardinal was was just he just kept hitting the window, uh, but that was more of a fight with himself. So I put the blind down and and that did it. Um, in this case, uh, there's a lot of uh, really great uh, window stickers specifically for birds uh, that 
uh, you know, that they can see um, with the UV. And even though they're not real noticeable to us, they're um, very prominent to the birds. So that's um, generally the, the easiest fix. Um, but in different situations, like with my blinds, uh, you, you know, you may have your own personal. Um, but hummingbirds can definitely strike a window and recover. Uh, but think how small they are. So it, it, they could, it could kill them easily. All right, Paul, anybody um, suggest what the most common predator is to well, hummingbirds? Okay, we do have some answers. We've got one is praying mantis. We okay. have snakes. And then we have two with cats. All right. Um, we're going to kind of touch on almost all of those. Um, number one, but not even, it, it, it's, it's not even by a long, it's, Number one, beyond anything, cats. I know you guys are probably tired of hearing that cats shouldn't be outside. <laughs> it's just they're so detrimental to the bird populations. Um, so for those three species that I talked about at the beginning, they are definitely the number one predator. Um, one of the things you can do with the feeders um, is have them high enough, at least like five feet up off the ground and allow enough visibility for the hummingbird to be able to see something coming. Uh, you know, yes, they're certainly fast, um, but, uh, you know, if they can't see what what the threat is, they can't, um, you know, they can't move quickly enough. So cats, I'm proud of myself. I'm not getting on a soapbox there. <laughs> Yeah, but very, very bad for birds. Um, I, two of the things that I see online uh, on social media a lot uh, that go around because, you know, any of these images on social media really capture our attention and then, you know, share, share, share. Uh, praying mantises and spiders. Um, yes, I've seen, I've seen the videos, praying mantises can't catch hummingbirds. Um, but I have to think, where is that hummingbird that a praying mantis is easily accessing that um, that hummingbird feeder? So I think that's more in the placement of the of the um, feeders. Um, and as far as the spiders, those orb weavers, those I call them garden spiders that um, do the zigzag. I mean, really cool, um, but uh, they can definitely be um, a threat. Um, so, you know, if you have a lot of hummingbirds in your yard, you just might want to do, uh, you know, a, a spider walk. If there's smaller webs, uh, those hummingbirds use those, you know, for their, especially if they're nesting around you. Um, otherwise, uh, it's, all, it's all just the, you know, it's all the cycle of life, right? I hate to see it, but, um, you know, it, it happens. But with the praying mantises one, I feel like that's probably one that's more preventable than anything else. Uh, and then bees. So if you have a bee problem like this, it's definitely, it's your feeder issue. Um, with those bumblebees over there, uh, with those inverted feeders, uh, that sugar water can end up on the outside um, of those because it's it's more shallow than those basin feeders. Um, so if you have a problem with bees, um, number one, you can try to move the hummingbird feeder. Sometimes that throws off throws them off enough. Um, otherwise, that's a feeder issue, and maybe that is just not the right feeder for your particular yard. Uh, that video that you just saw, wow. I mean, how rude. <laughs> those bees are so rude. That is such a risk for those hummingbirds. Um, and I can't help wonder if that's just a whole basin of sugar water <laughs> down there. Um, so definitely a feeder issue. That's not a good feeder if that's um, happening. Uh, one bee um, sting can kill a hummingbird. So just want to be careful. So talking about placement, um, is this good or bad? So, and we'll talk about placement, but what do you guys think about this hummingbird feeder? 
the feeder, the placement. What do you guys think? Any other questions, Paul? Uh, yes, the other question that we have was just to, I guess, reiterate the migration times when we would see them in our area, Harris County, Fort Bend County, you know, just mm -hmm. this area in general. Yeah, um, along the Gulf Coast, uh, March-ish, uh, they're going to be coming up from the south. Um, but again, we may have uh, winter residents here too. That is possible. Um, but for the migrations, March, they're headed north. And then uh, probably the beginning of August, uh, you'll start seeing some if you see the migrate, if you get migrating um, hummingbirds through beginning of August, uh, it really peaks like the first couple weeks of September, uh, can go to the end of September. Uh, but again, there, there are some resident hummingbirds. Um, I don't know after, you know, the treatment they got in February. Uh, <laughs> maybe they told all their friends, you know, that Gulf Coast is not safe <laughs> for winter. So, all right, good or bad, what are your guys' thoughts about um, Okay. I've been in Texas for almost five for five years. I probably need to start saying y'all. I just said you guys. Um, <laughs> Paul? <laughs> yes. Uh, let's see. We have one answer. Bad. It is too close to the patio structure. Uh, and then we also have another one from Patty. She says bad placement. Yeah. Everything about this, I think, is bad. It's too close to the, to the plant, to, the, um, to that lattice. Um, I mean, if you deal with uh, purple martins at all or, you know, things like that, you always have to think about predators. And this just seems like a predator nightmare. So not good. You want it far enough away that you're not making it an easy snack for um, anything that may be able to. Somebody mentioned snakes earlier like this. You know, I mean, I mean, if they have an issue with snakes in their yard, uh, I mean, this this is terrible. So just kind of be the the advocates for um, for those little this little little bundles of joy. And this is the last section grounded birds what to do. Um, so really again prevention is the best um, you know just kind of assess what's going on in your yard um, set up the feeder for safety use window decals uh, but if you do have a grounded bird uh, assess if it can recover like pick it up um, they, they suggest picking it up low to the ground because you know it could come to and fly off real quickly so low to the ground you know with an open palm um, and if it if it comes to sometimes it takes a few seconds um, you know, it'll it'll go off and live its little birdie life. Um, if it looks like it's not recovering, uh, you can confine it um, just a small box, something where it can breathe. Um, contact a rehabilitator. Uh, I have the um, one location on the next page. And uh, if it is a baby bird, um, first of all, who in the world can sees a baby hummingbird on the ground. I want to meet that person. That would be so tiny. Um, <laughs> but put it back in the nest if possible, if you know where it comes from. In general with birds, if uh, babies do not have wings, it should go back in the nest. If you cannot find the nest, you need to find a rehabilitator. Uh, if birds have, you know, like the, their real young feathers, um, they may have been pushed out of the nest. <laughs> Um, or, you know, if they fell, uh, it's, it's recommended to leave them in that area. Um, but I think with hummers, you might not have that much of a problem. Um, it is illegal to keep a wild bird in captivity. So yes, picking it up, seeing if it's okay, that's okay. Collecting it for the rehabilitator, that's okay. Um, but, you know, if you want to try to make a cute video online, um, you may not have the best um, you know, you're not looking out for uh, for those birds. So in our area, uh, I mean, the one I know of is the Wildlife Center of Texas. I know one thing that people um, it kind of they get frustrated. They think that they're they're going to come pick up the you know the bird. Um, these are all volunteers. It's just like our master gardeners. Mainly, they're all volunteers. So you have to take um, that bird or that uh, animal to that location and there is a drop-off location. 
I think it's um, part of right beside the SPCA. All right, quiz. How does a hummer, how does your hummingbird get nectar? Go ahead and put that in there while you're, while you have to suffer looking at this adorable cuteness. How does a hummingbird get nectar? And because I know there's a delay, I'm gonna do the second question also. And what makes a good flower? Do you guys remember? I know you remember. <laughs> Paul? Uh, no answers yet. Yeah, because, um, wow, I love on this hummingbird how that, um, the, those throat feathers, they actually don't, um, they, they extend down and they come away from the chest. I don't know what that is, so don't ask me. <laughs> okay, All right, so any we do have, yeah, laps it up. I guess that would laps be it up answer. like a cat. What makes a good flower? What shape? What what? Bright bright color, tubular shape. Yep. All right. Um, what else? Uh, oh, what else does a hummingbird need besides nectar? love and affection i don't even have to i don't even i don't even have to talk during this everybody's just going to be staring at this adorableness it's hypnotizing what else does a hummingbird need besides nectar and i'll i'll bring in the next one too and what is its biggest predator? You guys already know that. Protein. Protein. Yeah, definitely. Protein that's not insecticided. <laughs> so cute. So cute. All right. Biggest predator cats. Um, I know you guys will get that because I made a big deal about it. Um, key elements. So uh, you can attract hummingbirds with plants. You wanna provide those basic needs. Uh, use homemade nectar and change it frequently. Uh, be their advocates against predators and use those local resources. Um, I gave you all those really great resources. Um, those are the people that deal with this every day. And um, you know, that's, we, we're really lucky in this area. Here are those, most of those resources. Uh, I'm just gonna look through here. I think the only one Paul didn't put up was about the nests. Yep, everything else was on there. Uh, before I see if there's any last questions, my next talk is in September. Uh, I have a big gap because we switch, a couple of us switch, so uh, I have uh, plenty of time to grow uh, the microgreens for my next talk, uh, how to grow microgreens at the windowsill, September 16th. You don't want to miss it because, you know, I always give you great videos, although I don't know what kind of video I can give you with microgreens growing. <laughs> All right, Paul, any last questions? Uh, no, we've got them all covered. Uh, you did a great job, and I guess with the information, um, we got it all covered. So yeah. uh, thank you uh, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for attending. Um, you know, this is going to be sent out as a link with the survey. Uh, I know we ask this of you every time, but it just really is such rich information um, for us here at AgriLife Extension. You are uh, providing a really great service. Um, that's the only fee that we charge, right? <laughs> is is the survey? Um, but we have loved the surveys because it gives us the information um, needed to continue these so we appreciate it next um, in two weeks what is um, what is it um, Shannon with what topic I believe it is outdoor 
is it food safety or grilling safety? Sharing. Grilling. Oh, it's grilling. Yeah. yeah. So that'll that'll be a good one. So go ahead and sign up. And thank you guys for uh, being here. Thanks for supporting us.